Hello and welcome to Starting Conversations, produced by the New Mexico Humanities Council. I'm Bethany Tabor, and I'm delighted to welcome, Meg welcome Megan Cameron back to host the fourth and final installment of our series on journalism and democracy. Today, we'll be discussing small newsrooms and startup news media companies. Megan is joined by a great group of people who have each made an impact as citizen journalists by founding and forming their own hyper-local news outlets to serve their immediate communities. This program is made possible through the Mellon Foundation and their initiative, Democracy and the Informed Citizen. Megan is an award-winning journalist and radio producer based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. She is the newly named news director of KUNM. She's the former host of All Things Considered on KUNM FM in Albuquerque. And she is also the former TED speaker and current TED speaker coach. She's prepared a great program today and I will let her take it from here. Mexico Humanities Council. Um, and as Bethany mentioned this episode, we're talking about media startups. The last 20 years have not been kind to journalism. <laughs> Newspapers and other media have struggled with shifts to online advertising and social media. We've seen huge hedge funds like Alden Global Capital scooping up major media properties and then gutting them through layoffs or, and attrition. Local news organizations in particular have borne the brunt of the meltdown of our traditional business model where advertising dollars funded the spaces for placing news. And one in five local papers has simply closed in the last 15 years. Half of the counties in the US now only have one newspaper, usually a small weekly attempting to cover various communities and almost 200 counties in the country have no newspaper at all. So what is at stake for all of us if we lose these sources of information and the journalists who work di diligently to keep us informed at a time of rampant misinformation, these losses present a very real threat to our democracy, but also to public health, as we've seen in the pandemic. We also lose valuable watchdogs who hold our institutions accountable. So while it's easy right now to despair about the state of news, there are also many innovations taking place, and we're gonna highlight a few of those today. Joining us is Peter Rice. He's the founder and editor of Downtown Albuquerque News, a subscription e-newsletter covering downtown and surrounding neighborhoods. He previously worked at KUNM, the Albuquerque Tribune, as well as papers and public radio stations in Washington, Oregon, and Colorado. We also have Lou McCall. She's the founding editor of the Cuesta del Rio News in Cuesta, New Mexico, serving the communities of Northern Taos County. She has produced, edited, and written for several publications throughout New Mexico. She also writes poetry and nonfiction. Heather Bryant is interim executive director of the Tiny News Collective. It's focused on place-based local journalism, especially news organizations targeting unserved or underserved communities. The collective aims to launch 500 sustainable local news sites over the next three years. And Larry Rickman is editor and co-founder of the Colorado Sun. He was senior editor at the Denver Post, managing editor at the Gazette in Colorado Springs, and city editor at the Greeley Tribune. He spent 22 years with the Associated Press, including nearly four years as Moscow correspondent, where he helped cover the fall of the Soviet Union and the rise of a new Russia. He also supervised AP's coverage of the Columbine High School massacre and the coverage of the president presidential recount in Florida in 2000. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, Peter, I want to start with you. Tell us about downtown Albuquerque News, why you started it and the need that you saw for it. Sure. Well, I um, like everyone on this panel, I watched the depressing decline of journalism over, I would probably actually pick it for the last 15 years, uh, give or take, but I think we're basically on the same page there. And I saw a series of what I thought were uh, horribly misbegotten attempts to save the industry. And I thought everyone was doing it wrong. And so uh, I started as something that is uh, extremely local, which I thought was one of the things that was being done wrong and uh, charges money for subscriptions and has a paywall, which I thought was another thing that was being done wrong. And so that was kind of the origin of it. Uh, that was 300 subscribers ago in 2019. And uh, so far we're, we're having a great 2021. We survived the pandemic just fine. Uh, hiring freelancers uh, a little bit at the moment and uh, growing and uh, hopefully providing a more informative and influential publication for greater downtown Albuquerque every, every week. 
So you're focused on downtown specifically, just downtown. Why that focus and like what kinds of things are you covering? Because uh, I thought that the the best model for newspaper was always the small town paper. Uh, and I, I kind of cut my teeth in a small town paper in Oregon after college. And it, it just seemed like if you're going to have a publication, it should cover an area that has a cohesive sense of itself. And small towns kind of have that built in because you know you, you see everyone at, at some point you're gonna run into everyone in that town at the post office or the one grocery store or the Rotary Club or whatever it is. Uh, so I think that is the kind of atomic level of uh, print publication. And so I wanted to, to start there just because it was, you know, you, you, things are best built from the ground up, I, I tend to think. And Greater Downtown does have that kind of uh, cohesion to, to an extent. Uh, people who live in Greater Downtown do not think of themselves as typical Albuquerqueans. Uh, we're, we're way more into walking around and uh, bicycle lane and, uh, and, and we're more focused on the delivery of public services because a lot of them are delivered here in the form of the zoo or the botanic garden, but also a lot of the failures end up concentrated here in the form of homelessness and crime. Uh, and a lot of major economic things happen here too. Like we're all very much affected by the, the commuter class who comes in and out every day. Uh, we have that in common. We have the tourism economy in common, which is highly concentrated uh, in greater downtown. So it seemed like a good group that, that kind of had that vibe of a, of a small town that would be good to serve because we all kind of have something in common. Well, what's interesting is that you cover downtown, which has sort of that hipster vibe you talk about, but you also cover Borellis, which is a historically Hispanic neighborhood south of downtown. Kind of a totally different vibe, has different issues going on. So you bring all those together in that one publication. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. Uh, yeah, there's, there's, definitely, there's definitely a hipster vibe in many parts of downtown. Uh, you could probably, uh, probably the, the locus of it these days is probably the Sawmill neighborhood, which is home to a lot of new development and uh, a major food hall uh, and, and things like that. But there's, there's greater downtown definitely contains multitudes. I mean, it's not just uh, the Borellis neighborhood, it's I mean, South Broadway on the other side of the, the tracks there. Wells Park uh, has, has a lot of rich history that, that people are kind of only discovering now that it, they've also discovered it's a fun place to drink beer. Um, and then you've got places like West Old Town, which, I mean, there are like farms with livestock on them in West Old Town. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very much a, a, a big, you know, fascinating mix of, uh, of history and, and interesting current events and things that are guaranteed to make any reporter never bored. How, so you don't have a paywall and you have 300 subscribers for how much a year? I do have a paywall. Oh, you do? Uh, it's pretty fierce, actually. Um, <laughs> I and, guess I'm a subscriber, so I hadn't encountered the paywall. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, 300. And uh, it's about doubled in the last year or so. So hopefully, hopefully it'll keep going in that direction, which is, I mean, I, there seems to be plenty of room to grow. I mean, that's still only like 0.003% of the population of the two main zip codes we serve. So it should be, um, should be, should be plenty of room there. How much is the subscription, Peter? Oh, sorry. Uh, $10 a month or a hundred dollars a year. Okay. All right. A hot uh, deal. <laughs> and well, you're doing well enough that you've actually brought on some freelancers. So it's not just you. Yes. That's a, that's a kind of recent development. Um, but yeah, turns out that's awesome. Uh, you don't have to, you can work 40 hours a week instead of 50. It's great. Highly recommend it. Are you taking advertising? No. Okay. Um, and Which that, advertising? Yeah, it's, I'm not opposed to it. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing this for fairly capitalist reasons. I mean, uh, well, I should, I should rephrase that. I think the capitalist model can save journalism uh, as we know it in the United States. And and so 
I'm not opposed to advertising and by any stretch. I don't think it would work particularly well for us because it would take a lot of time to set up. And I'm not entirely sure that uh, customers who could get onto Google or Facebook and, and reach anybody based on their you know, gender and zip code or census tract or you know, what they like, do, do highly targeted pinpoint advertising for a fraction of what they would pay us. Um, I just don't see there being a lot, a huge market for that, uh, given how small we are. But I'm not opposed to it in the future, although I do think ads are annoying and they detract from the idea that this is a premium product that's worth paying for, uh, which is another thing I think journalism has done wrong in the last 15 or 20 years is, is try to put it out there that this is, this is, you know, this is something free and it's not. And I think people, people value things when they have to pay for them. Um, it's a weird bit of human psychology, but uh, I think it just works. It, it, it seems to work pretty well for, for other consumer goods. Well, um, can I ask you then, how do you um, see yourself serving people or readers who maybe can't afford that? I think that, uh, I think there's always been, and I grew up in this, right? I, I, you know, I worked in a lot of public radio stations. I think there is, always has been and always will be uh, a good market out there for, uh, for free, uh, either over the air or over the internet media. And I'm totally fine with that. Um, I think the public will be served uh, if there are thousands and thousands of reporters watching what the government does. Uh, even if they themselves are not consuming that content that those thousands and thousands of reporters uh, create. Um, and I think that's, that's not revolutionary. I mean, that's how journalism worked until about 2000 or 2005. Uh, and you, you, it, was, it was a little bit pay to play. It was pretty cheap, um, but it's still, I mean, my subscription is pretty cheap. So I think that's, uh, that's just, that's, that's the only way journalism has ever come up with in the history of the United States for getting tens of thousands of reporters on the beat. And uh, their democracy has no greater friend than tens of thousands of extremely bored reporters who love pissing off uh, public officials and, and filing records requests and things like that. So. So yeah, I mean, I do, I do occasionally think to myself, you know, it's kind of a shame that that I'm intentionally limiting my audience, but um, I think there's a a larger a larger mission here at work, and that's not to detract from the mission of any nonprofit uh, uh, or kind of uh, free at the point of use news service. There's there's always been a place for those, and there always will be, but I think the that was always the icing on the cake. Um, and we need to get the cake back. Nice metaphor. <laughs> uh, well, I want to turn to Lou McCall. Lou, uh, tell us a bit about Cuesta News, how it began, why it began. We began as a newsletter for the Quest Economic Development Fund. And Cuesta was a company town. There was a hundred year old molybdenum molybdenum mine. Yeah, I can never say that word either. <laughs> and when it closed, 300 families lost their livelihood. And so it was kind of on the way of becoming a ghost town, on the way to becoming a ghost town. And um, so Chevron, who closed the mine, they um, created the Quest Economic Development Fund to diversify the economy. And Cuesta is, um, everyone that comes here is, is just really surprised at how beautiful it is and what's going on here. Um, in the 1960s, it was the number one destination for fly fishing. We have the Rio Grande and the Red River. And um, you know, so, so part of Cuesta's renaissance is becoming um, a destination for fishing, recreation, wildlife, um, and also the arts, tourism, retirement. And so 
Uh, we started publishing um, a monthly paper in February of 2018. And uh, we started with uh, two part-time employees and a, volunteer, a VISTA volunteer who did our graphic design. And um, so we've grown. Uh, we've, we're, we started with uh, 12 pages. We're up to 32 pages. And we have online subscribers. We're a free newspaper. We um, distribute to postal customers in the communities of Cuesta, Red River, San Cristobal, Lama, Cerro, Castilla, and Amalia, New Mexico. And um, we want to keep it free. And um, our, our subscriptions, um, if somebody wants to subscribe to the newspaper, um, it is $60 a year or $5 a month. And online um, email subscriptions are free. And um, so we're moving more toward a nonprofit model. We've, we've, um, we're working with um, Locology, which is a local nonprofit. And so we've, we've really gotten um, a lot of boost from the charitable community in the last um, few months. And so is it, has it moved away from being just sort of a, a newsletter for the economic development folks to kind of a oh, broader? Oh, definitely. Yes. It, it was um, a newsletter. Um, I think they started in maybe 2016. And then we decided that um, uh, Lindsay Mape, Mapes was the economic development director for, for the village of Cuesta and she worked with the Quest Economic Development Fund. And we decided to create a newspaper. Um, the, the newsletter was, um, um, you know, it was, it was a really great newsletter. And I saw it and I thought, this is awesome. When I have only lived here for a few years and I, I saw the newsletter and, um, the president of the Quest Economic Development Fund is Malachi Israel. And uh, I said, I was so impressed with the newsletter. I, I've done community newsletters and I've done different publications. And he says, here, you need to meet Lindsay Mapes. And so we had one meeting and decided to do this newspaper. And um, it's, um, you know, kind of a standard tabloid um, news, newsprint. And uh, you guys do print and digital because maybe you have a less robust internet connections in northern New Mexico or? Um, well, we started just solely as a newsprint oh, okay. publication. And, you know, we knew that it was kind of crazy. Uh, we had the support of the, we, of the community and, and somehow somehow um, it's just grown and we have, have um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of the creative director and then we have uh, our new business manager is um, Lynn Skull, who's the Cuesta Economic Development Director. And so it's a really good mix of people. We recently hired, um, a assistant editor, which is fantastic. And we have a, a very professional um, graphic designer that came on board in the fall of 2018. And we have, um, we have a social media director now. And uh, more than I do it, okay, <laughs> I gotta say. Oh, yeah, get a social media director. It I is so it. awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, and I met, mentioned these people by name. I mean, I, I really would well, we'll have them. We have your, uh, I know you sent me your website address. Okay. So we'll put it up there because I saw you have a big uh, staff list and photos of everyone. So, uh, yes. which is great. And, I just, so your nonprofit model, how, how do you guys support your staff? What's your revenue model? Well, we do have ad sales. Mm -hmm. um, 
and you know we we haven't really survived um through selling ads so so um during covid we there were a lot of resources available to help us through that uh, we are selling more and more ads as as um, the economy has kind of opened back up because, um, yeah, the pandemic really affected our advertisers. You know, very small, small town local businesses, and so we we do have advertising. And then um, we've been working with the New Mexico Local News Fund, who has been fantastic, and they're helping us in our fundraising efforts. And um, we hope to hire a fundraiser. So very strategic. Um, and so what are you guys covering? I know you're launching a new website pretty soon in August. So yes. Um, well, you know, I would like to cover more local news. We, we don't really a lot, a lot of our almost everything we have is contributed by volunteers. We don't I really think it's important to pay our writers. So other than our staff, we we don't really pay our writers right now, but we hope that will change. Um, we we cover a lot of events and we have an we have an art section, we have a health and wellness section, we have business. We have a business profile every month that features a local business. We have sustainable living. We we want to have a senior living section and just really focus on seniors. Um, we have a volunteer of the month. We have we have astrology. We have a um, community calendar. And with our new um, with our new website, we're our calendar is gonna really expand to be a true community calendar. It's gonna live on our website, but um, the Village of Cuesta, the Cuesta Creative Council, um, you know, different organizations, the school districts, they're all going to be able to use and, and edit and post on, on the calendar. So, um, so that's really exciting. Um, I, I want to turn to Heather Bryant now with the Tiny News Collective. And just to be clear, neither Peter nor Lou are part of the collective startups, but I thought they seem to be in the spirit of what you guys are trying to do. Um, Heather, can you talk a little bit about what the collective does? Sure. So the, the premise behind the Tiny News Collective, there's a, a few different goals that are happening here. One of them is to help diversify ownership of media in the U.S., which is a factor in a lot of the long running problems that we've had in the industries that we talked about hedge funds earlier being, you know, part of this equation here. Um, and the other part of it is to truly help founders actually get started. The innovation and in, in local news is not technology or, you know, uh, uh, things like this. It's people who are actually in their communities, who care about their communities, who see a need for news and information that's not being met and want to meet that need. So what we do is we kind of basically clear the road for them to be able to do that by taking a lot of things off their plate that every founder has to do at the very beginning, like setting up an organization, actually getting that going, getting you know established as an entity. I mean, we're, we're literally setting up LLCs and then we sign over ownership of those LLCs to the founders, give them fiscal sponsorship, help them get going as an entity. Um, we have the entire technology stack built for them that is already configured for what you need to do for local news to be able to publish, to be able to have newsletters, to have analytics that are meaningful to you as a publisher that can inform what you're going to do, um, to be able to keep track of what you're doing as a publisher. And then a training program that works walks you through the beginning of how to get started as an organization and what it means to be a publisher, to be a very small organization trying to evaluate what does your community need most for you and then what it is you should actually be trying to produce for them. Part of our process at the beginning is all of our founders do um, community information needs assessments where they start to do research within their community and talk to people and try to understand what is it that you don't have news and information about and what is it that they could be creating to do that. 
and then begin to experiment with what kind of revenue model is going to actually work in their community. For some, that's going to be, you know, a combination of philanthropy and they're going to have donations. They might try membership. Some of them are going to try, you know, premium newsletters. They'll do local advertising, um, those types of things. What we want to do is just take a lot of those like structural questions and beginning questions and just deal with those at the beginning so they can actually focus on the real work which is doing that journalism and meeting those information needs and trying to figure out what particular model is going to work for them to become sustainable so that they can last within their communities. Um, everybody has to answer a lot of the same questions at the beginning. There's no reason that that has to be so hard and that everybody has to repeat that discovery process when we know there's actually a pretty good standard set of you know, beginning decisions that you could make. The best thing to do, you know, when you first start your newsroom is you don't need to spend six months going, oh, am I going to be a for-profit or am I going to be a non-profit or what CMS should I be using or how should, like, that's not the most important thing for you to be doing. Um, so what we can do is we can create capacity for founders by just giving them a place to start from so that they can focus on what the information need actually is and trying to meet that need and building themselves up over time to, to last. I was interested on your website. You said you're not trying to save local journalism as we know it, but I'm quoting here, we are empowering people to build something new and better, a true ground up ecosystem of diverse locally focused newsrooms that are from and for local communities. Can you talk about that difference? Yeah, I mean, there, there are a lot of things that we've seen journalism do for a long time and it has worked um, in different ways, but I think the important thing to remember is that it has worked for some people, not all people, or not a lot of different communities. And what we want to make space to do is equip founders to meet the needs that are in their communities. And that might look like something entirely different than what we've done before. And there needs to be capacity and space for them to experiment and figure out what that might look like. And that might not be, you know, article after article or you know what we're used to seeing is the way coverage happens it might be more collaborative it might have a lot more engagement and participation from the audience and the community themselves um, we want to make space for that innovation because that is far more likely to get us to a point where people are genuinely and truly reflected and represented in the coverage that they need and that is a really huge that's a huge thing for the industry right now. We're grappling at large with the fact that there are a lot of people who have not been served by news for a very long time. And these founders are an opportunity to finally start making space for them to, to do that locally. How many startups have you worked with so far? So we just brought on our first cohort. We're pretty early on. We just uh, introduced our first six organizations on Monday of this week, actually. Um, they're all very, very excited to get going. We're, we're thrilled to be working with them. There are folks who are very, very focused on their, their towns. They're from there. They've been living there for a long time. They really care about what people need. Um, some of them are focused specifically on the towns. We have one person who is focused on a school district that has like 10,000 students in it and the parents there. That's a huge information need that's been uncovered for a long time. So that's what she's looking at. Um, uh, one of our founders is working in Newark, New Jersey, um, just outside of Chicago and Harvey, Illinois, um, one in Austin, Texas, um, one in Los Angeles. They're serving the uh, Filipino diaspora there, um, which has been underserved by local news. Um, and uh, one in West Virginia, who's specifically working to serve Black people of West Virginia um, to, to raise up their voices and, and cover issues important to them. Wow, that's really interesting scope of different people. Um, I, I want to bring Larry Rickman into the conversation. I, I'm going to quote NPR about <laughs> your group, Larry. A group of disheart disheartened former Denver Post editors and reporters launched an upstart news site two and a half years ago, called it the Colorado Sun, and hoped it would rescue local news coverage from the dictates of hedge fund owners and Wall Street investors. In May, the Sun announced it had acquired and would operate a family owned chain of 24 suburban newspapers around Denver in partnership with a new foundation focused on local journalism. After a very traditional career, Larry, how did you find yourself in startup land? <laughs> you know, I really never set out to be an entrepreneur, but you know, I was working at the Denver Post, which is owned by Alden Global Capital, you know, one of the worst of the worst of the hedge funds out there in, in the journalism world. And you know, the Denver Post went from a, a height of 307 journalists in its newsroom down to about 100 uh, at the beginning of 2018. And um, when we were ordered to cut another third of our staff just weeks after we were forced to move out of our headquarters building in downtown Denver, 
a number of us realized that, you know, we could either stay and complain about it and lay off our friends and colleagues, dismantle a great newsroom, complain about it, or strike out and do something different on our own. And that's what we chose to do with the Colorado Sun. And um, we just decided that, you know, journalism was too important to be left in the hands of hedge funds. And um, that uh, we had a lot to learn. As I said, I never set out to be an entrepreneur, but, you know, the hedge funds sort of forced me to do it. And, um, you know, it was a roll of the dice uh, to start a new business, as it is any new business, whether it's a restaurant or a news organization. And, um, you know, here we are three years later, we have 165,000 newsletter subscribers. We have uh, about uh, somewhere between 13 and 14,000 paying members. And uh, we're a, a statewide news organization. Our uh, news side, um, non-sports, you know, uh, staff is is almost as big as the Denver Post now. So wow. we have grown a lot. We started off with ten full-time journalists. Uh, we have twenty people at the Colorado Sun now, and uh, we're we're growing every day. And you know, honestly. It, a lot of the things that uh, Peter and, and others said here really resonate with me, which is that, you know, digital advertising uh, was not supporting the Denver Post or, you know, many other legacy newspapers. It's, it, digital advertising becomes a treadmill where you have to run faster and faster and, you know, resort to crazy gimmicks, you know, pop ups and takeovers and autoplay videos and things that drive readers crazy. You know, my philosophy and our philosophy at the Colorado Sun was, well, look, if that's not going to pay for, you know, an adult newsroom, um, maybe we should try something different. And let's uh, try something. It's, it's so simple, it sounds naive, which is let's treat our readers with respect. If our, if our readers are the ones who are going to support us, let's give them quality journalism. Let's uh, not bombard them with takeovers and autoplay videos and all of those other things. And, uh, and, and you know, load up our site with tracking, you know, tags and codes and all that sort of stuff. Let's give people a good experience. We're fast on mobile. Um, so our model was, was pretty simple. Do quality journalism. But remember that, you know, doing good journalism alone is not enough. We've seen lots of good journalists who went before us and thought that would be enough, that if we build it, they will come. That's really not the case, you know, that... Yes, it starts with quality journalism, but really you have to remember that this is a business as well and, and treat it that way. And, and we have. So um, even though I never set out to be an entrepreneur, I, I le I've learned a lot in the past three years. And, you know, you, you made a point at the, at the very beginning, Megan, that there's a lot to despair, you know, when you look around the media landscape uh, in the country. But I'm, I'm an irrepressible optimist. I mean, you have to be an optimist to start a new, a new business. But I, I will say that what's really encouraging to me is exactly what you're talking about here. Yeah, you know, there, there's a lot of energy that's been released. You know, in, in my case, it was kind of thrust upon me because I didn't want to see the hedge funds take over the world and you know destroy great newspapers. Um, but there's there's a lot of talk in, in Colorado and around the country about we've lost so much already. You know, and and we'll never know the stories that weren't done. You know, the good guys who weren't celebrated, the bad guys who weren't exposed, the politicians who weren't held accountable. We, you know, we don't know about those things, but what we do know is that our democracy depends on informed citizens. And I'm hearing more and more of those conversations now in the philanthropic community, in the, just in the civic community in general. So I'm very much, uh, I'm very optimistic about our prospects and the prospects of others around the country. What is your revenue model, um, Larry? Yeah, so primarily uh, we are membership driven, but uh, we don't put all of our baskets in the membership. I mean, all of our eggs in the membership basket. Can I uh, ask, is that different than being a subscriber? Is it more membership like a public radio or is it? So, you know, our, our terminology is this. We have some free newsletters and those are subscribers. We have members who choose to pay us as little as $5 a month. We have premium newsletters. Uh, that start at $20 a month, things like uh, the unaffiliated, which is our politics focused newsletter. And we have an outdoors newsletter and, and some other things. Um, we have been fortunate enough to get some grants as well. And um, before COVID hit, uh, we were seeing some great success with uh, public events. And um, we've really looked with um, uh, some inspiration to the Texas Tribune 
they've been immensely helpful to us over the past three years. But um, the Texas Tribune is largely uh, a grant driven organization. And um, we decided that that is, is its own form of treadmill and that we didn't want uh, that either. That so what we've really tried to build a sustainable news organization that is reader supported, number one. But, um, you know, we do have sponsors. Um, that's, I don't know if I mentioned that before, but we, we have sponsors. Most people might call those advertising. Um, but um, primarily we've been supported by, by readers and uh, $5 a month uh, members. And you're a public benefit corporation, right? What does that mean? We are, and it's really interesting. Um, you know, Heather mentioned how you know people wrestle with you know are we for profit are we non profit and we wrestled with that question too. Our hearts are very much in the uh, non profit world, but we we uh, we started off initially as an LLC because that was the fastest way to get up and running as a for profit LLC. But we we quickly discovered that there was this hybrid um, structure out there that not every state even recognizes called a public benefit corporation. It really is a hybrid. We are for profit and yet it is, uh, public service is actually written into the very DNA of our company. We must demonstrate a public benefit every year. We, we issue a public, uh, an annual report demonstrating how, and we submit ourselves to an audit. How are we benefiting the public? So it's okay to make a profit. I mean, we are capitalists uh, as uh, Peter was saying as well, but, um, we're not out buying mansions in West Palm Beach uh, the way all in global capital is. You know, we we invest our money back into our news organization and back into our state. So that's that's really what we're all about. How are you collaborating with other outlets? You know, that is one of the things that I think that we've done really well and that we've learned uh, from the Texas Tribune, which is, look, one of our biggest challenges as a new news organization was just public awareness. I mean, first of all, I have on my team, my partners and colleagues, we're, we're some of the most experienced journalists in Colorado. The Denver Post won a Pulitzer Prize for its coverage of Columbine 20 years ago. I have more people on my staff who covered Columbine than the Post does. So we, we have an extremely high powered, uh, experienced uh, staff. But one of the smart things that we've done and that the Texas Tribune did was, hey, we need to grow awareness of who this Colorado Sun is and what we're all about. We give our content to newspapers all over the state. So our stories appear on front pages from Grand Junction to Greeley to Aspen, Durango, um, Steamboat Springs, all over the state. And that is, has, number one, uh, benefited the public, we think, because it's given people uh, access to our quality journalism, but also you know, there, it has helped us. It has grown awareness of the Colorado Sun. And we, uh, we see a bump in readership every time and membership every time we uh, have a big story that runs on a front page uh, out in uh, on the Western Slope. And are you print and digital or just digital? Well, the Colorado Sun is digital only, although again, we share our stories with legacy print newspapers. But as you, as you mentioned at the outset, um, you know, be careful when you pick up the telephone, you never know who's gonna be on the other end of the line. Um, we found ourselves uh, as co-owners of 24 print newspapers uh, here just a, a few months ago. It was a, a chain of 24 community newspapers that um, basically we all know who buys newspapers these days, you know, it's hedge funds. And uh, it came down to really either we were gonna step up and assume ownership of these 24 newspapers or they were gonna fall into the hands of a hedge fund. And none of us wanted to see that happen. So while in a way it was liberating to get away from print when we established the Colorado Sun as a digital news organization, print is like riding a bicycle. You know, We were able to climb right back on and, uh, and do that well. So um, I, th I think there's still a future for print uh, as you know, uh, again, echoing what Peter said, these are hyper local news organizations. These are the only people who are covering city councils and county commissions and school boards and police departments in those communities. And we were just determined to make sure that those voices you know, weren't silenced. So we're, uh, we're helping them and uh, working with them and helping to up their game on the digital side of things and, and doing what we can on the print side as well, so. It's exciting. Yeah, um, yeah I'm inspired by everything 
you all are doing so because it's easy to get pretty depressed. <laughs> it is. Uh, but, I, go ahead. I hope. I okay. hope. <laughs> this is a question for all of you as reading an article in Politico. It painted a pretty grim picture about keeping readers for local news. Um, and I certainly, as personally, I have a lot of friends. They read the Times, they read the Washington Post, they listen to NPR, etc. They do not engage with a local news source, but they are big news consumers. So I'm just curious, how do you find and keep your readers? Well, I'll, I'll just jump in uh, right away. I will say that obviously the pandemic was was horrible uh, and continues to be just devastating. But I will say that for a lot of people here in Colorado, it underscored the power of local information. Yeah, you can get uh, national and international news from the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, whatever. But who's going to tell you really what's happening with COVID in your town or in your in your neighborhood? And um, we saw our readership just explode uh, over the past year. And uh, those people have stuck with us. And um, we, you know, we serve them. We are committed to giving them the information that they cannot get someplace else. I mean, that is the, the core of our business model is to do stories that others aren't doing, that readers cannot find someplace else. And, you know, again, Peter, you know, I hats off to you for recognizing what your market needs, you know, and um, that's that's what it's about is finding finding a, a way to connect with people uh, that, you know, others aren't uh, connecting with. Anyone else want to chime in on that? Peter, do you have any thoughts about that? Definitely. Uh, <laughs> I think, I mean, I, I think when we say that local news has problems attracting readership or retaining them, I think it's largely because it's not local enough. Uh, there's this there's this idea that, you know, I I might conceivably want to pay for a product that tells me what's going on in the Northeast Heights of Albuquerque. And without being too much of a cynical bastard, I just really don't care. Um, I don't care what's going on on the West Side for the most part. Uh, I care what's going on in my neighborhood and the neighborhoods that surround that neighborhood. And then a few other random places that that just are kind of unique to my life. Like I care about Uptown because I used to work there and I've got some friends there. Uh, that's, you know, that, that's just kind of how people are. I mean, that's, that's basic psychology. So we've got a lot of, in your average paper, we've got a lot of stories that just don't hit that mark at all. Uh, and they're, you know, quote unquote local, but they're just not, not resonating with people because it's not the reality they live every day. Now, when you get super hyper local like I do, you can, you can almost get to the point where you're taking requests for stories like you're some 90s DJ or something like that. Like the, the lead story in today's downtown Albuquerque news uh, is about a city effort that they were, of course, trying to do a little bit on the, on the DL to buy up a bunch of property around the rail yards. And I got that story because a reader sent me the letter the city sent him and was like, what's up with this? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Uh, we'll, we'll do a story about that. But that's, that's just a good example of, of what local news does at its best. It covers the intersection of public policy and real life. It's, it's not about, you know, it's it certainly, I read the Times too, right? The psychodramas of our national government are perennially fascinating and they have great writing and it's wonderful. But what really matters to people is their local park and their streets and their water supply and what the cops are up to and the local restaurant scene. And if you cover that and you can and you can offer this implicit contract with readers that if you pay us this money, you're going to see people, you know, and places you're familiar with and you're going to you're going to get actionable intelligence uh, that can help you live a better life. I mean, that's. You know, that's that's about the best deal there is for five or 10 bucks a month. And, you know, to kind of blend the model uh, Larry's got and I've got. Well, we'll see how quickly the journal picks up your story and doesn't credit you, maybe. <laughs> I, you know, the uh, this may be a little inside Albuquerque baseball, but the TV stations in many uh, uh, situations kind of get the whole like news is where public policy meets real life philosophy more than the journal. And they are 
far quicker to pick up downtown Albuquerque news stories than uh, than the than the papers. Uh, in fact, it wouldn't surprise me if that story was on TV tonight. Uh, that's definitely happened several times in the last few months. Do they credit you when they do that? Oh no, but you know whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Lou, um, uh, tell us a bit more about how, you know, I know you're in a different space than Peter or, or Larry, but how you're finding readers, keeping them. Is it just, you don't have a lot of other options up in Cuesta, right? That's true. That's true. Um, uh, the Taos News is our, you know, paper. And a lot of people think of the Cuesta del Rio News as being their newspaper. So we have a lot of community pride. And also, in a way, we're sort of a community supported media because uh, we get requests for stories. You know, we, we you know, get emails saying, well, why don't you feature this person as the volunteer of the month? And, and uh, um, so actually we really rely on people to tell us what's going on because I, you know, we, we don't have a, a reporting staff to show up and do stories. You know, I mean, there can be a major car wreck and it's not in our paper, you know, it, sometimes as a monthly newspaper where, you know, it turns out to be pretty old news by the time we print. And in, in some ways we're more like a magazine and we have themes, um, you know, like our, our July paper, we focused on the community of Lama and uh, we had, you know, we, we did a story about the Lama Foundation, the Lama Community Garden, the Lama Asekia, um, the, and, and we were kind of excited because our food section, we've been calling it quarantine cuisine for the last, you know, year and a half. And we, um, uh, we dropped that. And because we were celebrating the community of Lama and people are starting to get out, we decided to focus on potlucks. So the community sent us their favorite potluck recipes. And I've heard from um, people that they just love our recipes. So, um, yeah, so we had that, you know, we have, um, we've, November is generally focused on the veterans community and- um, yeah, You have the veterans memorial not far from you, right? Yeah, exactly, yes. And we have a new veterans memorial park that was recently rededicated to the late Senator Carlos R. Cisneros because he was a great friend Cuesta and uh, um, so yeah it's, it's an interesting mix I mean Peter's talking about chicanery at the city and someone calling them but it's also um, stitching together the community through things like potlucks through things like highlighting who your members are in the community so um, it's uh, it's a really interesting mix it's sort of how media can keep those kind of communities together um, and Heather, did you have any thoughts about this sort of critique of like, well, you're just not, there just aren't enough local readers for local news. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think what everybody said here is actually just a really good re reinforcement to, you know, thinking about that question. It's not that there are not enough. It's like, if your journalism does not solve a problem for them, then they have no use for you. <laughs> you have to do journalism that actually addresses the needs that people have in their lives. Um, and I, I view journalism as a service, not as a consumer product, actually, and as a service, like the three things that local journalism should accomplish is the first one is it needs to give people the information and news that they need to navigate their own circumstances. The second thing is, is it needs to acquaint them with and introduce them to and help them understand the circumstances that other people in their community are experiencing. And then the third one is to give them the information and the idea of how to participate in all of the processes that can affect those circumstances, right? So that they can solve the problems in their own lives, that they have an understanding of the things that other people within their community are trying to navigate, and then also actually give them a way to participate civically and within their community to help make changes that their community might actually need. 
I and mean, when you can do that, then you have something that is of value to people and is actually has a role in their life as opposed to being optional. And I mean, just as a, a personal example, I, I grew up in a deeply impoverished family. We did not use local media because it did nothing to help us actually navigate those circumstances. And there are a lot of people with versions of that happening. If their local journalism can't actually help them live their lives better or be able to make different decisions, then it has no utility for them. So one of the key things that we really have to think about is what is the role our work actually has in our community's lives? And is, is it a, an essential role to them? Is it providing value and helping them live better lives? You know, if, if I can just jump in for a minute, yeah. I mean, to me, what, what we've seen in the past, you know, 10, 20 years uh, and more is that media consumption has been become a very passive experience. You know, it used to be you went down to the corner store, you subscribed to your paper, you turned on the six o'clock news. It was, you know, appointment viewing. And today, you know, I ask students when I speak at universities, you know, where do you get your news? And they just sort of shrug their shoulders and say, it comes in my news feed. And I say, I, you know, I don't know what that means. You know, you, if you guys aren't paying attention where you get your news from, and then, you know, I, I recently asked a young woman, well, well, talk to me about that. Why don't you care where you get your news from? And she said, well, news is just depressing. I don't really, you know, I don't like to, to read the news. And I said, well, with respect, that's like saying you don't like food because all you've ever eaten is fast food. And, you know, what we're trying to feed you at the Colorado Sun is a quality meal where you sit down with a you know, cup of coffee and a glass of wine and truly feel push back from the table when you're finished and feel like you had something that was fulfilling. And you know, my hope is that by giving people quality news, rather than the click driven uh, kind of fast food journalism, if I can use the food analogy further, that people uh, are used to. I mean, at the Colorado Sun, we know how to get clicks, you know, really well. Um, we just choose not to do it. I mean, for instance, if there's a new baby at the zoo, you know, you publish zoo babies and everybody clicks on it and they go, ah, and I love zoo babies for the record. But, you know, that's a, that's a 25, 30 second uh, view on a, on a story. Over the past three years, our readers have consistently spent more than three minutes on our stories. And I, I like to joke that it either means we have really slow readers or we're producing content that resonates with people. And I think that's the key is finding ways to connect with your readers, give them uh, stories and journalism that they care about and that you know, affects their lives. And that's on us as journalists to, to know our audience and figure out how to reach them. I was just laughing because I believe the front of the Albuquerque Journal today is a baby hippo. <laughs> oh, we I love zoo babies. I do. I really do love them. But there we is just a hippo doing. exception. You're going to have that tomorrow, Peter? Yeah. Absolutely. Read all about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be a big article. We kind of, every okay. Friday, we do something called the Roundup, where we just take a lot of little tidbits like that. It's, it's like, I think people kind of want to relax on Friday. So, yeah. You baby get the hippos baby are pretty cute. Them. <laughs> oh, they're super cute. And they're right down the street. Like that baby hippo is like 500 feet away from me right now. <laughs> okay, you get an exception. It's local. <laughs> uh, I was, uh, where did I read this? Uh, Steve Waldman, who's the co-founder of Report for America, which places journalists in newsrooms across the country. He would like to see local news be declared a public good, an essential service that nobody can make money providing and let governments finance it with subsidies, refundable tax credits, tax incentives, government advertising. So what do you all think? I think that would probably work on some level. I mean, you, you just it, it's worked in other countries for a long time. I mean, you just take the BBC and you make it more local and uh, then you're done. I think that's that and uh, a kind of rapacious for-profit model are my two biggest hopes for getting to a point where we've got- Those are like polar got, opposites, Peter. No, no, I don't think so. Okay. I mean, they're in some, in some philosophical ways they are, but like my, my North Star here is, is journalists. It's, and tons of them. Um, they're, you know, it is, uh, it's, probable that most of the Albuquerque city councilors go weeks, if not months, without getting a call from a journalist. And that is a good uh, Well, I can say one has gotten many calls from one of mine, not responded. But anyway, <laughs> one. 
uh, yeah, it, it, it definitely it results vary by counselor. Uh, <laughs> mine, actually, well, he gets a lot of calls from me, but uh, he's also downtown, so he gets a lot of downtown related calls. So, uh, but there's all these other, all these other like small advisory committees and boards that are doing pretty important work and uh, are doing it unwatched. And that's also a catastrophe. And we need to fix that as soon as possible. And we need more bodies to do that. And we need to, we need to pay them well so that they will stick around and do it and learn the organism that they're covering better. And so be able to uh, hold it you know, more accountable than, than before. And there's two main ways of doing it, I see quickly. And one is to make it a wildly profitable business again. Uh, and the other is to infuse a lot of government money into it. And uh, I'm cool with whatever, whatever gets politicians and bureaucrats, uh, you know, that voice back in their head that somebody's watching, I'm for it. Fair point. <laughs> Um, I am envious of when I see the BBC, they just seem to have unending resources. They so do. yeah, all over so the world. Can I say one more quick thing? One thing yeah. that hasn't been brought up, but, but yeah. which I think has also weakened in the last 15 years is the news media's industry, industry's uh, capacity to hire lawyers and lobbyists, which are uh, almost as essential as reporters. Um, we, you know, to the extent there's a pack of rapacious lawyers going and, and suing governments for, for access to documents and lobbying for more free press and more just government transparency, you know, just kind of at the source, that's, that's something we also need to be able to afford in addition to affording to pay our, our reporters decently. Mm -hmm. Yes. We have um, the New Mexico Foundation for Open Government here. I don't know, they don't seem to have a lot of capacity to send lawyers up, but um, maybe, but yes, I hear what you're saying. Most organizations don't have the ability to have a, a lawyer on staff. <laughs> they used to. Yeah, on retainer. Yeah, and it helped. Um, there is a bill in the US House right now called the Local Journalism Sustainability Act. It would do things like offer subscription credits, tax credits, tax credit to help hire journalists tax credit for small businesses to spend on advertising and local media. I, do you think this has a potential solution or is it just trying to support a model that maybe no longer works? I think it's worth exploring uh, new ways to support journalism. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm old, I've been in this business a long time and, you know, talk of government funding of uh, newspapers, you know, is anathema to a lot of journalists and, they worry about it. But I, I would also say that uh, legacy print newspapers have been supported by government spending for decades through legal, the publication of legal notices. And to me, as long as, uh, as long as we can put up a firewall between politicians and news organizations so that, you know, new, you know, editors aren't called before a house committee to explain themselves, you know, on their, you know, expose, you know, or whatever that might be. Um, I think it's worth exploring. You know, we need to get creative. You know, the old models definitely aren't working. Hedge funds pose, I think, the greatest threat to our democracy, period, you know, in our country. And um, we need to figure out, the old models aren't working and we need to figure out new ones. So I'm all for creative uh, proposals. You were gonna say something, Heather, I think. Yeah, I, I, I really appreciated the thoughts from Peter and Larry so far. And I think there, whether these are the specific proposals that are gonna get us there, you know, there's there's work to be done to see that. But I think what's really important between both what Steve Waldman says and this proposal that's you know kind of passing through is that it's an acknowledgement that access to quality journalism is a systemic problem, not an individual problem. We cannot solve for funding all of journalism, individually speaking. And whether or not we should, like our society cannot function. You cannot have a healthy functioning society without access to a shared universe of facts and information, right? And that's a systemic problem, not an individual problem. So as we think about what these potential solutions look like, thinking through that lens is really part of that because when you're, when you're leaning on the idea that we will pay for all of journalism, just like convincing people one person at a time to pay for it, I don't see how we get to a world where we have those thousands of reporters or where we have the capacity that we genuinely need to do this work. 
And I mean, when, when you talk about like paying for journalism on an individual basis, then we're talking about the people who can afford journalism. And we don't have a healthy society when the only journalism we get is through the people who can actually afford it at that moment. Like putting a cash register between people and the information they need, that's not going to do anything for us as a society when you can go online and spend the next three weeks watching hour after hour of misinformation and propaganda for free. And that finds people and we need the actual reported information to get to them too. And we need to do a lot of innovation and thinking about how we remove every barrier we can between them and that information. It's been a great conversation. You know, you, thank you all so much. Bethany, did you have anything you wanted to add or any questions? Um, I sort of am thinking about one question that's been um, going through my mind. Like this is such a, this has been a discussion that is such a good argument for in favor of hyper-local news. But then I also think about um, publications that have been popping up in the last five or 10 years very recently that are very thematically focused. Um, you see a lot of publications that are focused on, uh, on diasporic uh, themes like different populations or even uh, LGBTQ populations. Um, I come from a background of art writing. So I'm just like, all, I, my feed is like oversaturated with a lot of this like art heavy publications. And so I just kind of, uh, to throw it out there generally, I just want to hear your all's take on hyper local reporting or local reporting versus this sort of like more thematic publication and like what you see, how do they work together? How do they sort of create discord? What is that? Um, I, I, I have uh, some thoughts on that. So my other hat besides tiny news is collaborative journalism. I've spent the last eight years doing research on collaborative journalism. And one of the things that I see that's, that speaks to your point there is the need for more intentional, direct and consistent cooperation collaborations between outlets where you can connect hyper-local to more thematic type things. And I think really what we end up with is we need tiers of, of coverage kind of where you have organizations that are focused on specific topics that can really dig into it and bring expertise in it. Like climate change is an example of a topic that needs experts to cover really well, right? That's a very specific thing. Um, there are other, you know, finance, elder care, all those things do require a broad, uh, a well of expertise to do them well, but that is news that should be, you know, circulating in other ways. And I think our, our opportunity and, and, and to Larry's, you know, collaborations with Colorado Sun is, is a huge thing for you guys as well. That's, I think, how we start to get there when we stop viewing organizations in competition with each other, but rather as players within an ecosystem of information and news and that there's a role for everybody to play and more cooperation as opposed to competition is, is better for us. I mean, there's no shortage of politicians and big companies and everybody else who's happy to see us shortchanged and low resourced because we weren't talking to each other. That's a problem we can easily solve for ourselves that doesn't change anything about business models. It's just a matter of actually starting to work together. And I think that's a really key part of our future. Hmm, interesting point. You know, I, I, again, to use another food analogy, you know, that the old legacy newspaper was like your supermarket where you go in and you can get everything you need for tonight's dinner, you know, and, but to me, the media landscape today looks a lot more like my old neighborhood in Brooklyn, where if you want a really good cheese, you go to the cheese store. You want a really good cut of meat, you go to the butcher. You want a really good you know, bread, you go to the baker. And it's, it's more work as a consumer to do that. But I, I actually think that we get higher quality products uh, when we do that. So, I mean, we don't try to be one-stop shopping at the Colorado Sun. We don't cover the Denver Broncos, for instance, that sort of thing. We leave that to others. We, again, we try to fill the gaps that others aren't doing. And to me, uh, niche, there is, there's, I'm on team democracy, I'm on team journalism, and there's plenty of room. There are so many stories that need to be told. And you know, we just need to figure out a way to connect to our, to our readers and to our audiences. And I actually think that, that readers are very well served by the, the many smaller publications that are popping up uh, around the country. I'm, as I said, I'm an irrepressible optimist. So I love what I'm seeing. Yeah, I would, I would say I'm not too worried about niche publications either. One, because of what Larry just said, and it's, we're all, we're all on the same team at the end of the day. But also because I think, I've, I don't, I've never really researched this or probably couldn't prove it, but I have a sneaking suspicion that this is always how it was. Like a general interest daily newspaper 
was just a series of new of niche publications that happened to be in the same packet. Like they, you know, the, these dif different sections. When I was a kid, I didn't look at the front page, went straight to the comics or the, you know, any something like that. A lot of people just get the paper for the sports. Plenty of people used to get the paper just for the ads, for, for heaven's sakes. Uh, so I don't, I think we've always been really niche -y. Uh, the, the advantage of the old model was there was at least some, you know, possibility that you would stumble across some other community. And I think we have to work on that. And I think uh, mm -hmm. uh, Heather's right about that, but it's going to be, I don't know what it looks like, but here's to the future. <laughs> Lou, did you want to say anything before we wrap up? <laughs> Um, I would like to respond to um, some earlier questions. Um, that's exciting to me that um, there's going to be an act in the New Mexico legislature. No, it's in the U.S. House of Representatives. U.S. House of, okay. We'll that, see where it goes. <laughs> well, I, I'm an optimist too, and I think the tides have been turning and, um, you know, miracles happen. And, and I, I really feel that, um, you know, people are pretty, pretty disgusted with lack of transparency. And I, I see a lot of reform in a lot of, lot of almost everywhere. And so um, I, I think paying for lobbyists and lawyers and um, having political support, um, could be what saves local journalism. Well, Megan, do you know how much money was at stake with that bill? I don't actually. Uh, I have a link to it. You mean how? I was just curious. I imagine it's just like a rounding error. Uh, the... I don't even know if they had money attached to it. Actually, you mean the um, this uh, local journalism sustainability act? Yeah. Because uh, kind of what's infuriating about the last 15 years is just how cheap reporters are to hire. I mean, there's... Well, yeah, there's that. It's really... Uh, so, yeah, anyway. I'll, it's I'll, uh, I'll, hiring journalists. A five-year credit of up to... <laughs> just flipped away from me again. $25,000. Um, because you have too many pop-ups on this stupid whatever outlet. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> not the color of sun. <laughs> Uh, okay. you know, one of the interesting things that happens locally, like like these things, are there places that are doing local information districts where they're funding, not doing this nationally, but they're doing this locally. Um, the info district project in New Jersey is one that's doing that, where voters are voting to fund information projects. Yeah. So it would be a five-year credit of up to twenty-five thousand dollars the first year and fifteen thousand dollars each of the next four years to help newspapers hire and pay the salaries of journalists. Um, a five-year credit of up to $250 annually to cover 80% of subscription costs for readers the first year, 50% each of the next four years. A five-year credit of up to $5,000 first year, 2,500 each of the next four years for small businesses to spend on advertising in local newspapers. Um, so yeah, I hear you, Peter. It's especially in our state, um, we are a low wage state. Journalists are way underpaid and that's why a lot of them, you know, cut their chops here and move on. And that's not good for New Mexico either. So. Um, Does it say in that news story who's sponsoring that bill? Yeah, it was, well, it was actually, let me see, Ann Kirkpatrick, Democrat of Arizona, Dan Newhouse, Republican of Washington, has 78 co-sponsors, but it didn't make it out of House Ways and Means. Um, it was written. Yeah, it was reintroduced on June 16th. It has 18 co-sponsors, 13 Dems, and five Republicans. Okay. So, interesting. It's actually bipartisan, <laughs> believe it or not. So, so I don't know. We'll see, because we all know the Senate is where things go to die right now, apparently. So, but maybe, maybe they can support local news. <laughs> Uh, well, I thank you all again. It's been a great conversation, and I thank you for everything you all are doing out there in newspaper and news media land. Um, thank you, Bethany. 
Yeah, thanks everyone. This was uh, such a great conversation. You were also generous in your insight. And uh, in the description of this video, there will be uh, links to all of these publications um, and some additional resource links. Um, so be sure to visit that. And thank you so much, Megan, for being such a great host of this whole series. And uh, we will see you later.